Broadcasting to the Wizarding World since 2008. HP ANA's official Harry Potter podcast. Official Harry Potter podcast. This. 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 This is Hogwarts Radio. This is Hogwarts Radio, episode 219 for October 28, 2018. Hogwarts Radio is HPANA.com's podcast discussing all things Harry Potter, Fantastic Beasts, and the rest of the Wizarding World. For the quickest up-to-date news on the franchise, make sure you check out HPANA.com. Hello everyone, and this is Hogwarts Radio, broadcasting to Harry Potter fans worldwide since 2008. I'm Terrence Kingston. I'm Bailey Riddle. And I'm Luke Hogan. Our show can be found virtually anywhere online, such as iTunes, the Google Podcast app, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Radio Public, and other places where podcasts are aggregated. It doesn't matter where or how you listen, just make sure to tap the subscribe button and we guarantee you'll have a new episode each Sunday. We also invite you to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram so you'll never miss an update from the show. Don't forget, Hogwarts Radio is also on Patreon. By pledging, you'll have instant access to many benefits, including exclusive merchandise, host vlogs, behind-the-scenes planning of the show, Hogshead Radio, and much more. Visit patreon.com slash Hogwarts Radio to sign up today. Welcome to episode 219 of Hogwarts Radio. And for those of you listening on Patreon right now, got a sneak peek of an up-and-coming podcaster. <laughs> He's going to be an amazing, an amazing broadcaster someday, if that's if that's the direction that he chooses to go in, Luke. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll set to see, I guess. I mean, uh, we'll, we'll see what he what he what he likes to do i don't know if uh he'll still have a, a market for harry potter podcast at you know at, at that point but uh we'll, we'll figure it out when we get there right <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And uh, for those of you that don't know what we're talking about, well, this is one of the amazing benefits that our patrons uh, get to experience as they listen to us record our episodes live. So head over to patreon.com slash Hogwarts Radio and sign up today. Here's a cool fact that I didn't know uh, as I was flipping through the news this week. Butterbeer, butterbeer sales at the Wizarding World top 20 million cups sold. That's a lot of butterbeer. That's so much butterbeer. I'm almost getting, like, my sweet tooth is is cringing at how much butterbeer that is. Well, our friends over at MuggleNet have some Potter-esque kind of stats. For example, number one, in addition to the Black Lake, Hogwarts could also have a butterbeer pond because of 20 million cups sold. With approximately 280 students enrolled at Hogwarts within a given year, Hogwarts students would need to drink over 71,400 servings of butterbeer. With butterbeer prices up to $6.99 each, butterbeer sales are equivalent to more than half of box office revenues for Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. That's crazy. Uh, 20 million butterbeers is equivalent to half the number of copies of Deathly Hallows sold within its first year of publication. And then the final one, Universal has sold five times as many butterbeers than Harry Potter and the Cursed Child has sold total number of copies worldwide. That might be my favorite stat. That's pretty <laughs> funny. <laughs> That's crazy. That pretty funny. That's a lot of butterbeer, guys. And, yeah, and I'm thirsty now. I only account for half of those. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of interest, I know we've said it on the show a couple of times, but I would think it would be fun to revisit it. What is everybody's favorite butterbeer? Hot, cold, frozen? Well, I'm definitely going to go with hot. Yeah? I haven't had it yet. Yeah, it, it's it's so good. It's almost like you're drinking a hot coffee, but it just tastes like butterbeer. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. It's exactly how I pictured it to taste. Luke, I know you haven't made it out to the Wizarding World yet, but if you had the choice, would Next you go... Next month, he will have an opinion. That's... I was going to say, I, I will have an opinion in a month. <laughs> So. <laughs> should, should we just follow up then? Yeah, let's follow up then. If okay, so okay. is prediction time? Is this speculation time? Uh, is this which where one? we're gonna post a poll on Twitter? Oh. Yeah, we'll do that. And we'll revisit in a month and see which one, uh, which one I should have liked more. <laughs> <laughs> I guess there's going to be a lot of butterbeer in our future when we go. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, what are all the types? Is it just the two types, hot or cold? Or are there other options as well? There's hot, cold, and frozen. No. Hmm. You, you know what? There's only just regular. That's it. In my is opinion. That, is regular, that your, your unleaded, premium. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, well, we'll keep an update on that. And yeah, that should be interesting. I'm interested. I'm pretty easy when it comes to drinking things. So <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll make it, a, I'll, I'll have a, a well-informed opinion. At- it's going to go to LA. It's going to be like 50 degrees and we're going to make him drink a frozen butter beer. <laughs> There's no such thing as too cold. Well, guys, we got a big show to get to today. Um, we're going to be discussing the latest news in the Crimes of Grindelwald saga. We've got a Halloween discussion and a- another round of our fun game that we debuted last week, Two Truths and a Lie. So let's start with the news, the big news coming out of the week. And I don't know which one's bigger. I don't know which story's bigger. So the first one here is Claudia Kim uh, gives uh, an update on the Nagini casting controversy. Uh, She said it was really unexpected. And this is according to the article over at Hypable. And she said that she really didn't expect, you know, the backlash that was presented with uh, by a few fans uh, with with Nagini she goes when I found out that I'm playing Nagini I thought it was meaningful because it's such an important in the Harry Potter series and Harry Potter is a film franchise with many Caucasian actors so I thought many Korean viewers would be happy and she's gonna you know she believes that the controversy is gonna die down once the fans see that Nagini on the screen. She says, I'm looking forward to viewers being satisfied and the controversy fading away once the film premieres. I don't perceive such controversy solely in a negative way. I believe changes can be made by giving attention to an Asian's promotions like this and through the people that look into such issues. Um, and she does trust David Gage. She goes on to say in the in the article that she, she follows him with trust. And uh, on J.K. Rowling, she said, well, she said scriptwriter J.K. Rowling probably searched for an Asian actress because she researched the origin of Nagini. She goes, I'm not sure if it's just my pride, but I think I was able to bring out a different vibe as a Korean in Hollywood. Yeah, it wasn't something I expected um, there to be as much backlash as there was. Um, It seemed like there were kind of two different things. There was the the backlash of uh, the race involved as, I don't know, maybe a token kind of thing which i I don't think that was the intent at all um for as as you kind of pointed out in in the article a a pretty whitewashed cast it for all of their film series in general see where that comes from but there was also quite a bit of backlash on it just the fact that it's nagini like we saw i think gretchen's gut reaction was uh, a bit telling that i think a lot of people are not a huge fan of of it being involved uh the way it's the way it seems like it's going but well i, I think let the movie tell the story and see see where it fits at that point yeah absolutely I- yeah i completely agree i'm i'm waiting to see what happens before i have an opinion i honestly i, I mean it's not that i'm un- it's not that i'm ignorant about the matter I just feel like I'm uneducated as to why this was such a big deal. And I know that we talked about it you know, previously on, on I think, was it like episode 216 or something like that. Uh, but I just, I still am failing to see why the casting of an Asian to play this character was, was such a wrong thing to do. But I agree. Let's go ahead and wait for the movie to, you know, to play out. And I think that's what most of us are are waiting for. And speaking of, this kind of goes into our next news story. Ezra Miller gave an interview on the crimes of Grindelwald to Entertainment Weekly. You know, he got he kind of got heated about people like talking smack on Twitter. <laughs> And he said, why don't you just wait until you see the film before you start talking expletive on Twitter or wait to make up your own mind about something for once in your life? Do your own research, make up your own mind, follow your heart and really, really investigate situations before you identify yourself and pick a side and start throwing things at the opposition, because that's what's totally screwing everything up right now. And and it polarizes us. We're all human and there's a lot of things we can agree on. So I I don't know, was that just in like in reference? to one particular thing or was this like everything that he's seeing online i don't know i mean i definitely agree with ezra i think that people are very quick to judge and take sides because of the way that the news works and people are constantly you know well what did you think about this so i think he's got a valid point that we need to just wait and see i mean but we really wouldn't be doing our jobs if we were sitting here picking the trailer apart picking these pictures apart forming opinions theories and and things like that like why is he attacking something like that i I guess the way i look at it is he's more kind of going after like why is every single bit of information that we've got that's not vanilla 
like just vanilla cookie like oh yeah this we expected this to be a part of the movie like every single thing is being put under this micro this microscope and blown kind of I don't know, and some people would say out of proportion. I don't know that I would. I mean, the Dumbledore being gay and how that was kind of botched became a huge... Con- like, every single thing has been a controversy. <laughs> like, why is it under such a lens the way it seems like it is? And I, I feel like that may be where he's kind of going at it. It's like, like, let's just relax and let the movie be the movie when we get there. And I, I think, I don't know if he's really attacking, like, you know, what we're doing, where we look and say, you know, we're speculating on what the movie's going to be and, you know, all these things. And we're, I think, genuinely excited to see the movie. I don't think he'd be upset with what we're doing at all. Um, I think he's going after the, hey, not every single thing should be front page news of wow they messed up again which is what it seems like a lot of the news has been to me i don't know I, it, to me it just kind of look it kind of depends on which outlets you're really looking at um you know there's some outlets that try to just present both sides and just try to report the facts as is and then there's some outlets that just grab on to what the fans are saying and write articles, opinion pieces, editorials based on what these fans are saying and how these fans really feel. And I don't know, it's like, you know, on one hand, you have the the really conservative, careful kind of group. And then you have the fans, on the other hand, that are just kind of like flipping out that things aren't being addressed like they should, uh, like groups are not being represented. And then uh, I, I just, I don't know, I, I, I agree. I mean, I totally agree with Ezra. Like, you know, just wait until we see the movie. And then break it down, analyze it, make up your own mind, form your own your own opinions and stuff like that. Don't pick sides. Uh, and, and it's funny he had uh, he had some comments about on Dumbledore and Grindelwald not being explicit. And he says it's a funny idea to me that every form of representation has to look the same. For me personally, I find Dumbledore's queerness extremely explicit in the film i mean all around he sees grindelwald his young lover who's the love of his life he sees, he sees him in the mirror of Irised. what does the mirror of Irised show you nothing more than the desperate desire of your heart if that's not explicitly gay i don't know what is i think it's also really powerful to have characters who are fascinating dynamic people doing magical works in the world and that the story does not only pertain to their sexuality people have to take a moment and acknowledge the gift that joe rowling gave us by writing by writing one of the greatest characters in literary history one of the most beloved characters across the whole spectrum of civil society and the beliefs and ideologies there one of the most beloved characters and then at the end of writing that series oh yeah and he's gay what step to me she is forever a god for that um so yeah yeah i mean he's right in this quote like people seem to get the idea that every form of represent representation has to look the same and i you know i i i mean i agree i i agree with what he's saying yeah i think he makes some some pretty good points i'm i'm, I'm with him it's funny how people have different definitions of what explicit is i mean if people are if people are waiting for dumbledore to come out and say you know I love him or I was gay. That's that's explicit. Um, it, it, I mean, ultra explicit is him kissing the mirror. Vera said, you know, in a shot, that's but that's something that we're not going to see. So, I mean, I, I think there's different. He's right that there's different definitions on what explicit has to look like. I mean, and, and he's right. What, what it comes down to is just wait make up your own mind, do your own research, and follow your heart before you pick a side. Next news story, how Harry Potter translators made magic in every language. So in Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, Hermione makes a correction to one of Harry's essays about Jupiter's moons. Europa is covered in ice, not mice. In Norwegian, that wordplay plays different, plays out a little different. Europa is covered in is, not Fizz. Fizz, in case you were wondering, is a Norwegian word for fart. That's fantastic. I'm glad that was <laughs> I'm glad that was included. You know, and and it's just that misunderstanding is just one of the examples of many scenes in which the 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 Potter saga presented a unique challenge to its international translators. What was it a couple of years ago there was Something about muggle, wasn't there? Muggle meant something else in a different language, a different kind of translation. I can't can't ca- quite remember that, but like they were not able to use that word. They had to think of something else that was closer to it that 
made more sense in the context that it was translated. Kind of like what we learned last week. Tom Elvis Riddle, Marvelo translated into Elvis. And I believe that is all the news for this week. I'm sure we'll get some pictures to go off of next week. Some other things that are going to piss other people off. But for now, let's talk, let's talk a little music. And Luke, you have kind of a different rock update for us this week. Yes, I sure do. And so it looks like two tracks from the upcoming Cursed Child score um have been kind of pre-released um as the score itself is set to be released on november 2nd of this year which is 2018 if you hear this in the future um the score was composed by grammy award-winning uk musician imogen heap or imogen heap i'm not exactly sure um Sony Music Masterworks is set to release her music of Harry Potter and the Cursed Child Parts 1 and 2 in four contemporary suites. I don't exactly know what four contemporary suites means. Um, so maybe maybe hard copy would be two discs per part. So four, four discs. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense with most music being consumed digitally these days, but that's what I would imagine for contemporary suites means. So the two tracks that were released, uh, the track one is called Platform Nine and Three Quarters. Track two is called In Trouble, and then in parentheses, again. And um, so I listened to both of these today, and um, definitely pretty pretty good overall. Like, I haven't seen the play. Um, I don't, I've, I have read the, the published version of it, um, and I can kind of imagine where these happen, but I don't exactly know how it's done. So I'm kind of mentally making some leaps here to figure out what's going on. But track one is very experimental atmospheric electronica with, um, orchestral accompaniment and center stage in this is kind of non lexical vocables. I know that sounds super fancy in all this, but it's basically kind of a, a real common singing thing of, hey, we're not really saying any words. We're, we're going through these tunes kind of using nonsense words or sounds. So it's, I mean, it's beautiful. It's, it's really, really well done. The vocals are, are very, very nice. Um, it's super relaxing and full bodied, you know, with half the calories. No, it's a, <laughs> it's a total joke, but um, it's, it's definitely moving and emotion inspiring and overall a, a really well-designed soundtrack track. Terrence, what'd you think about it? I, uh, I really, yeah, I, I like this one I, out of the two. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute. I, I like the second one, but this one, I had a hard time because I, you know, like you, I haven't seen the, the, the play yet. So I had a hard time kind of figuring out how, this would fit into the platform nine and three quarters scene. I mean, it, if there's no visual element, I, you know, I'm kind of lost with the music. The music itself is beautiful. It is, it is emotion inspiring, but you know, it's just, I, I have to have some sort of visual context to, to plug it in and make that connection. Oh, wow. This, this is why these parts crescendo. This is why, you know, some of uh, the elements of this, particular track are uh, articulated the way that they are i just uh I, I i want i want to put it in some sort of visual context i do mm -hmm. i'm with you it, it definitely feels like there's a story going on behind this you know like it's clearly in time with something that would be happening visually i completely agree with you and uh without having that frame of reference it's it's nice it's atmospheric it's uh that's really all I can really say about it. It's mm -hmm. it's worth listening to. It's very it's super relaxing. Um, it kind of makes me think of um, groups like Enya at, at, at mm -hmm. in points um, or other kind of atmospheric electronica groups. Um, I know in the uh, image in Spotify biography, it mentions that she's done work with uh, acts such as Dead Mouse and mm -hmm. things like that as well. So in here it says uh, it for her general work it reflects influences of uh, influences of Kate Bush, Annie Lennox, and Bjork. I can definitely definitely see the Bjork inspiration in in this track. 
in trouble again again this is kind of an experimental electronica tune but this one has a much different feel to it it's got a march style driving beat it's got electronic enhanced string sections and again non-lexical vocables um it clearly seems to be fitting into a more action or suspense suspense filled scene which makes a ton of sense when you look at the track title being in trouble again um, definitely seems to be fitting behind a story, a narrative as well. And uh, again, I just don't have the visual representation of what that would be yeah, or you, where this fits into the story that I think I know. You know, let, let's listen to this one right now. I do have this one pulled up. Um, it's only just a few seconds long. You know, I really like this one because it reminds me, it has that Narnia-esque feel, and it's definitely definitely easier to, to visualize. And I don't know if that's because it has uh, more of a vocal presence for me, but I, I'm just kind of able to see something else, you know, as I listen to this. Yeah, I mean, again, it you can tell it's, it's driving something. There's plot going on, and um, a really, really interesting... Because you know, I can I can see there's likely going to be choreography to what's going on here, and um, it I don't know, it kind of makes me more interested to to see how these two tracks fit in to the the narrative of the play itself. So I definitely definitely recommend checking it out. Uh, both of these songs are pretty short, and I'm, like I was kind of alluding to, I'm really really interested to hear the entire album once it's out, uh, which should be november 2nd is what i'm seeing and uh so stay tuned for that hopefully it'll be available digitally in spotify and i can do another more encompassing review have we gotten a track listing or anything like that i don't think so right i this was the first i've seen at all of any of this i so i nothing that i've seen mm-hmm. okay. um so definitely check out our hogwarts radio spotify list uh called Hog- Hogwarts Radio Rock, W-R-O-C-K, and uh, follow along with us as we go through more Wizard Rock. So just a few announcements this week. Fourth-year patrons can expect their signed album art and a handwritten thank you note from the hosts and other goodies coming to them by the middle of next month. We're going to be collecting addresses securely don't worry very soon we'll probably be using google forms or something like that uh, and these will be going out the same time uh for domestic and abroad patrons fifth year patrons will get all the above and entered in for a random drawing through which we're going to use raffle copter for uh, for a uk copy of tales of beetle the bard signed by all the hosts so we'll not, we'll be announcing the winner on a future episode probably about the same time we send out all of our uh, Patreon goodies. And if you're not a patron, make sure you visit patreon.com slash Hogwarts Radio. Take a look at our video and read all the great things that we have for you and then sign up. It's super easy. We just released our second Into the Common Room segment with a special appearance by a special kiddo. It's fantastic. I love it. I love that was going to be in there. That was that was hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Last but not least, we're looking for interested Wizarding World fans to help us run our social media accounts. Please send us an email to staff at HogwartsRadio.com if you're interested. Uh, We have our Tumblr back in our possession. I think we lost it for a couple of years, but um, I gave the information to Bailey uh, just last week. So she's been taking a look and we have a decent following on there. I've been working on tumbling. There you go. (laughs) We also ask that you rate and review our podcast wherever you listen. Your support goes a long way to letting other podcast listeners know what you think about our show. You don't even have to leave us a review. It's just make sure you just rate the show. Give us that star rating or whatever, a check rating, whatever 
whatever platform you're listening to us on right now, they do have a rating system. So we kindly ask that you just rate our podcast. Well, guys, since Halloween's, what, like two days away, I figured it would be fun to have a Halloween type of discussion this week where we kind of go through what happened on Halloween on various years. Some interesting stuff, guys. A lot of interesting things happen. So October 31st is a date many muggles know all too well. And our source today comes from Potter Moore, so you can view this information over there as well. October 31st is a date that many muggles know all too well as a day for dressing up and achieving various levels of success, carving pumpkins and simply celebrating all things spooky. For Harry Potter, Halloween became a haunting part of his life from an early age for a very different reason. In fact, the eerie date seemed to follow him around. We'll talk about that here in just a minute. But funny that the Deathly Hallows share their name, well, half their name, with Halloween too. In the Wizarding World, Hallows, of course, are known as the three enchanted and hugely powerful objects that can unite to conquer death. At one point or another, Harry has temporarily possessed all three of them. Seeing as the Muggle holiday celebrates the supernatural and the unknown, how fitting that the Hallows should be so named in such a familiar way. And that Harry, of all people, should be so intimately connected to both. Very spooky. So, let's go through the years. The thing that we know all too well is the day that his parents died. This was the date when everything changed. As Lord Voldemort stormed Godric's Hollow and callously murdered Harry's parents on October 31st, 1981, this date would become legendary in two very different ways. For while Harry lost his parents and was plunged into a miserable life at the Dursleys, the rest of the Wizarding World celebrated their newfound peace with Lord Voldemort mysteriously and temporarily vanquished. We saw the date once and for all in the emotional scene where Harry visited his parents' graves. So that's that's how we know that they died on the 31st. What a very morbid date. (laughs) Yeah, there's quite a few sad things that are related, but there's also quite a few happy things that are related to Halloween for Harry. Uh, One of them being Halloween is the day that Harry, Ron, and Hermione officially became a trio. On a very different Halloween, one decade later, and barely a handful of months since Harry had started his new magical life at Hogwarts, he experienced a far more traditional night of festivities. Oh, okay, traditional for a wizard at least. First, (laughs) there was the glorious Hogwarts Halloween feast, complete with live bats, over large pumpkins, and a troll in the dungeons. The only problem? The last part wasn't supposed to be a Halloween decoration. But the scary scene in which Harry, Ron, and Hermione found themselves embroiled in a fight against an unleashed troll actually turned out to be another hugely important moment in Harry's life. Not because knocking out a troll as a first year is pretty cool, but because it was the day Hermione joined Ron and Harry's friendship group and formed one of the most iconic trios that ever lived, in our humble opinion. Despite the unusual circumstances, Harry and Ron, who had earlier in the day insulted Hermione in typical Ron fashion, saved Hermione's life, thus fusing together a legendary friendship, not to mention getting Ron off the hook. So this is probably one of my favorite Halloweens. It's because Hermione, you know, they, like you said, they become they became a team. They became a trio. They This is where they stood up for one another. They confronted dangers together. And I really, I really enjoyed that. Um, I really enjoyed seeing them come together, especially since... Ron was giving Hermione such a hard time at the beginning of the book. Yeah, I mean, I, definitely. That's uh, it was pretty clear cut that there are a few things you you can't live through and uh, not end up as friends afterwards. And taking down a eleven foot mountain troll is definitely one of the. I'm with you. It's uh, it's a nice moment. They they kind of stop being on each other's nerves a bit, and um, yeah. I, Iconic Trio is born. Um, In book two, this is also Halloween, is the day that the Chamber of Secrets was opened. And um, so Harry's second year at Hogwarts promised an even more Halloween-ish Halloween. First of all, there was the fact that he got to go to an actual ghost party. I mean, come on. Awesome. Celebrating the death day of nearly headless Nick. Um, But if the buffet of moldy cheese, maggoty haggis, which is fun to say, and tombstone cake weren't scary enough, the rest of Harry's 
Kirby's Night was absolutely petrifying. No, literally, it was it was petrifying. Um, you know, taunted by a troubling voice inside Hogwarts Nick's party and arrived on the scene of something that would affect the school's entire year. This, of course, was the opening of the Chamber of Secrets. If enemies of the air beware wasn't horrible enough, there was also the shocking sight of Argus Filch's cat horrifically frozen and hanging by her tail. I mean, come on. Uh, come on. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that's a shocking sight. I I guess you got to be a cat person. <laughs> I mean, if you thought the cat was dead, wouldn't you be terrified? Not really. I mean... I, who kills cats in a school? Well, that's true. I, I mean, but this, we've already <laughs> seen at this point, we've already seen a tree beat the hell out of a car. So nothing would really surprise me. That's true. That is true. I'm holding my tongue well, on. And I guess if you, put the cat, if you put the cat into the perspective that enemies of the air beware was written in blood on the wall, I think that's much more concerning than the it's cat. The whole, it's the whole scene. There's there's an air of eerie <laughs> around. I, it, it's kind of it, an amalgamation of everything that we've seen the voice in the walls saying rip them tear them uh yeah i, I think it's the the context oh and there's this hanging cat uh, it's <laughs> not a not a good cherry on top of this what can, the hell cake can, can i just ask like <laughs> what what makes them think it was written in blood whenever they initially see enemies of the air beware? Like, uh, it uh, couldn't have been done in, like, red paint? Like, why does it always have to be blood is the first conclusion that people jump to? I mean, I would imagine they have a different consistency. It's going to look different. And if it's, I don't know, dried at all, or if you can smell the irony musk of the blood. Yeah, are <laughs> the know. words flaking off of the wall yet? Because they're dried. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's gross. <laughs> Well, if you watch Making a Murderer 2, they talk <laughs> about uh, different blood splatter um, forensics. So there you go. Check that out. And maybe maybe there's an expert that, you know, they have at the castle. Maybe Argus Filch is a, a blood expert. Who knows? That's very possible. Hey, speaking of Filch, do y'all like his, uh, his reaction? Oh, he's the worst. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I'll kill you. It was very fitting for him. I'll kill you! <laughs> yeah, red wedding much oh my god thanks Bradley. <laughs> guys we have to listen to this this going part. on out go on my way my this way is, this is that scene Potter, what do you you murdered my cat I'll kill you I'll kill you I'll kill you I'll kill you that that is hilarious i love that <laughs> so funny <laughs> um. oh. so moving on into harry's third year this is the year that or the day halloween is that sirius black broke into hogwarts for harry's third year surely the poor lad was due a peaceful halloween right as it turned out the answer is no <laughs> in Prisoner of Azkaban, a new threat haunted Harry in the shape of escaped Azkaban convict Sirius Black. And as luck would have it, the events of Sirius's escape reached an apex on those dying embers of October when an unfortunate security slip-up led to Sirius breaking into the notoriously safe Hogwarts castle. After leaving ominous slash marks on Gryffindor's house portrait, the fat lady, Hogwarts was officially plunged into a very dark Halloween night. As it turned out, Sirius Black wasn't really that scary after all. The fact a perilous Death Eater had been able to live in the Hogwarts grounds as a rat for three years, however, was pretty bad. Now, you, you know what's sad about this is that this was actually the first attack on Hogwarts that we've ever seen. I mean, regardless, if it's just like slashing portraits and stuff like that and the ransacking of the Gryffindor common room and, you know, the... the the bed, the bed area and stuff like that. This is unsettling because this is the first, you know, Hogwarts is supposed to be like the safe kind of haven for, for all these students. And the fact that this happened just made it even more dark, I think. 
I mean, it's not really the first time that we've seen something terrible happen in Hogwarts, though. It's the first time that a completely outside source has come in, but it's not the first time that something inside of Hogwarts has been on the hunt. Trolls? Is... Dungeons? Well, yeah. Okay. Uh, to me, to well, me, it almost feels like if you look at it, they all come back and like, oh, it's all like the place has been roughed up and like it's, uh, I guess this is really just where they, the, he slashes the uh, the portrait, right? She, the right. portrait doesn't let him in. Right, right. Mm-hmm. So so it's it's later on that he actually gets the passwords from Neville, with basically stolen by Crookshanks, who's the worst. Um, <laughs> See, cat. and uh, gets Neville in trouble because of it. Cats are um, bad. Cats are bad. No, I'm kidding. Totally kidding. <laughs> cats are bad, okay. Um, cats are bad, okay. Don't mess with cats. Cats are bad. <laughs> so yeah, it it's definitely pretty intimidating because yeah, I mean it. All, we've been whole year since the summer that there's this dark wizard out there and oh my god he was here like that's that's foreshadowing kind of brought into your face like it's i think it adds up on like a whoa that's messed up and so the final i guess thing that happens to harry on halloween is he's picked to be a Triwizard Champion on that day. The final time we heard of Halloween in the series, believe it or not, was Goblet of Fire. And it's a memorable one. So with the excitement of the Triwizard Tournament, day was meant to be fun, a relaxed one for Harry, where we catch one of the three school champions as a humble observer. And finally, a year where he wasn't going to be the center of attention, or so it was for like, five minutes before Harry found out that his name came out of the goblet fire itself. And Dumbledore calmly asked him if he had put his name in the goblet of fire. We all remember that, that classic scene, the prospect of a life threatening yes, series, very calmly. <laughs> the prospect of a life threatening series of tasks, as well as a school wide ridicule from people thinking he was a chancer who tricked the goblet. Can't imagine anything more terrifying for a teenager yeah poor harry because <laughs> this is actually As something if he didn't have enough going on in his life <laughs> no joke i mean like okay because he was looking forward this year to you know the year started out good they they went to the triwizard tournament to wrap up the summer and you know he comes back to hogwarts he's like okay you know nothing crazy is gonna happen this year and then fate is like haha hold my butterbeer and all this all this stuff starts to happen to him so yeah definitely terrifying i i think you're i, I completely agree with yes of all seven years of all seven this is the one that going into it there is nothing out of the i mean there's there's some like oh like the dark mark is back but like once you're back at hogwarts like that's not gonna matter right like there is nothing for Harry to be like, oh, I have something to worry about. <laughs> like every other year. Yeah, sure. There's something on his mind or he, it's like his first year there, which is crazy enough as it is. But like book four, he's just like, I'm so excited just to have a normal year. Can I please have a normal year? And then no, you, <laughs> no, you may not, sir. <laughs> Yeah, he's like, I get to lay back. I can't participate in this challenge anyway, so the focus is going to be on other people. It's going to be awesome to watch. Like, how ex exciting. Joke's on you, Potter. <laughs> Good one, Potter. <laughs> oh, oh, my goodness. I really do feel sorry for Harry in this year. Uh, and, and I also remember in the book, like, this is... We see a lot of Hogwarts in this book because that's where, you know, it all takes place. And we see things happen like him getting that fight with Ron and they're mad at each other for like, you know, half the year or some crazy amount of time like that. We see, you know, a bunch of different things. And I think what I, I think this is actually one of my favorite books and one of the worst series adaptations, the book adaptations, book to film adaptations. But yeah, definitely a terrible. They were mad at each other for what a month? Yeah, it's only a month. I mean, I'm exaggerating. November first to kind of the beginning of the end of the month. Yeah, right around there. But it feels 
like a lot longer because uh, yeah. all the lead up to that first task. There's I feel like several chapters, mm-hmm. <laughs> but it is rough to read. <laughs> it's the first time that they've had a, a spat, so it's 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 a big thing. I would love to hear your guys' thoughts on why J.K. Rowling picked Halloween as this date, this 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 pivotal date in the Potter series. Why couldn't it have been like, I don't know, like Thanksgiving or something like that? Why why Halloween? What do you think? Well, Thanksgiving is an American holiday, right? Okay, well, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> just so just to pick that one off. Well, back. okay. Well, yeah, another I, date. I feel then. like Halloween is... I feel like it's just the right amount of time into the school year. Like, things are okay for almost two months, and then Halloween rolls around, and okay, now we have our plot twist. And it's spooky. I mean, it, just all of the story and lore around Halloween itself, it's perfectly conducive for a wizard story. It's a fantasy story in the real world, you know, low fantasy thing. I think it's a, a perfect pivotal time. Like like Bailey was saying, the time of the school year is perfect for things to unravel a bit so they could actually be figured out before the end of the school year, which clearly has to happen. And um, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a quarter of the way through perfect time to let the you know what hit the hit the ceiling fan and uh, it's spooky i'm just Ooh. i'm kind of thinking why is it needed They've because got their pumpkin spice juice <laughs> <laughs> i'm kind of thinking like why is it needed though you know it, it's a school that has ghosts floating around like <laughs> if that's not spooky i don't know what is okay well that does wrap up our discussion about halloween uh let's move into two truths and a lie And I'll kick it off here. This was fun to play last week. We have some interesting ones this week. So for me, you got to pick out the lie. So the first one, Deathly Hallows was almost named Harry Potter and the Elder Wand or Harry Potter and the Peveril Quest. Number two, Dumbledore sang with Frank Sinatra in 1936 in New Jersey. Or number three, Sirius Black and Fred Weasley both died laughing. Which one is the lie? I'm going to go with number one. I, I do not think Harry Potter and the Elder Wand or Harry Potter and the Peveril Quest were almost the name. That's the one I was leaning towards as well. Is that going to, you're leaning towards it, but is that your final answer? Sure, we'll call that my final answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the lie. I still can't believe you guys believe this because the lie is Dumbledore saying with Frank Sinatra in 1936 in New Jersey. (laughs) It feels like something that would be in Pottermore somewhere. (laughs) (laughs) Like it it feels, it feels right. (laughs) It's like a Hogwarts. Can you imagine like a Hogwarts version of uh, New York, New York, like start packing the trunk. I'm leaving <laughs> on the train. <laughs> and there's Terrence's next Wizard Rock single. Oh my God. <laughs> Stop giving me ideas. Uh, but you're right. Yeah. You're giving them to yourself. But... Hey, Aldous, I'll meet you in Hoboken. He's <laughs> <laughs> like, I gotta, I gotta deal with something. This, this, yeah. this new kid. <laughs> I could see that being a uh, fun fan fiction. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I would love to write that. That would be amazing. If any of our listeners would like to write a Dumbledore, Frank Sinatra fan fiction, we would love to read it on the show. So get on. We'll that. read it on the show. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I still can't believe that you guys thought that Deathly Hallows was not almost named Harry Potter and the Elder Wand or Harry Potter and the Peveril Quest. And J.K. Rowling actually said she didn't choose those two because they sounded like kind of generic. So they would sounded corny. Peveril and, Quest sounds really cheesy. Yeah. And I feel like Elder Wand kind of gives away too much. I like how I, I really like the Deathly Hallows name because it's like, what in the world could that mean? Yeah. Like it doesn't give anything away because we hadn't heard of them. And then it kind of unfolds really well throughout the story where if you hear elder one i think it puts too much emphasis on that being kind of the crux at the very end like it kind of downplays the other two i think fun fact she decided on the deathly hallows title while she was in the shower well there you go (laughs) that's where all great ideas come (laughs) all right two truths and a lie 
I own 17 Harry Potter themed candles. I own 55 Harry Potter Funkos. Or I own four full sets of the Harry Potter books. Oh my God. This one's tough because I could see you having all of these. And I did see her in pre-recording. I saw her. I was counting. (laughs) Uh, Bailey, I'm going to have to go with. It took her a while. I'm going to have to go with you do not own 55 Harry Potter Funkos. I'm going to go with the four complete sets of the books. One of you is correct. (laughs) Because I absolutely believe that she has 55 Funkos. (laughs) I own... 53 Harry Potter yeah. Funkos. Oh! <laughs> wow, 53? Are you kidding me? I am not kidding. That's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> nice. Wow. All right. We ready for, for my two truths and a lie? Yes. All right. I went a little bit gobble, gobble to fire movie themed with this one. Alfonso Curran passed on directing Gobble to Fire because he was in post production for Prisoner of Azkaban. In Gobble to Fire, Ralph Fiennes was finished shooting in four days and or for Gobble to Fire, 3,000 girls were auditioned for Cho Chang. Ooh, this is a tough one, but I think I'm going to go with the first one. Alfonso Ooh. Cuaron passed on directing Gobble to Fire because he was in post-production for POA. I think that they didn't want him back or he didn't want to come back or something like that. But... I am going to go with they did not audition 3,000 girls for Cho Chang. Hmm. Well, one of us what do I correct. get for a stumper? Both of you are wrong. <laughs> oh. Uh, Ralph Fiennes was done shooting in two days. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, I was going to say, if anything, it's less. Yeah. He only yeah. had really the one big scene. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that really was that really was it. Well, and the, the Riddle House at the very beginning, which yeah. I don't know if he was really even in that. If anything, it was just voiceover, right? Probably exactly. so. Yeah, that's what so, I'm thinking. Yep. Uh, yeah, more than... It was technically more than 3,000 girls auditioned for Cho Chang. So I potentially could have been clearer on that, but I didn't want to give it away. <laughs> um, and yeah, it, at least it's stated that Alfonso Caron passed because he thought he was still going to be in Prisoner of Azkaban, Azkaban post-production. Oh, well, look, the more I, you know. I can't actually verify that myself. That's just what IMDb states. Oh, okay. So I don't know how, <laughs> I don't know how credible that that is. That's just what I found. Nice. I didn't call Alfonso while we were setting up or anything. Oh, you didn't? Damn. No, not not this time. You not don't this. have him on speed dial? Oh, no, I don't have anyone on speed dial anymore. I mean, come on. All right. Well, that is about it for our Halloween type of episode. I feel like it was like more of a Goblet of Fire type of episode. <laughs> Um, but either way, we had a lot of fun this week and everybody have a safe and happy Halloween from all of us over here. Thank you to all of our patrons who support us. And if you're not a patron, head over to patreon.com slash Hogwarts radio today to get started. And also a thank you to those of you who are just listening to the show. We encourage you to share our episodes with your followers over on social media. Let other Harry Potter fans know what you think about our podcast. And as a reminder, you can stay up to date with us over on Twitter facebook and instagram and don't forget her don't forget her of course don't forget to subscribe and rate the show wherever you get your podcasts thank you so much for tuning in everyone once again i am terrence pinkston i'm bailey riddle and i'm luke hogan that does it for episode 219 we'll be back in november god already with episode 220 thank classy hogwarts that was bloody brilliant god's wallet (laughs) <laughs> hey, uh, <laughs> I was thinking. I was thinking if you can get him up to the microphone and say it, I'll keep it in. <laughs> Come here, bud. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> He's actually I've got it. a job for you, kid. Uh, child. Come here. <laughs> I am coming. So are we redoing the whole intro? Ready? Just put this in your ear. Come here. I need you to say something into the microphone, okay? Can you hear them talking? Hi. Um, Hi, Griffin. Hi. My name is Griffin, Griffin and Hogan on the podcast. <laughs> what to say? What are you going to talk about? Harry Potter? Yes. <laughs> what about Harry Potter? Um, The car crashed into... The tree? Huh. Yeah. Can, can you... Back on my 
<laughs> what else? Ron Weasley and Hermione? Ron Weasley and Hermione were in the car. And even, even, it's even Harry Potter. And Dumbledore. And Dumbledore. Do you, do you, you have like a... Potter? Do you like I... Do you like Harry Potter? Uh-huh. Yeah, what do you like about it? I like when the car crashed into the tree. Yeah, that's a cool part, huh? Yeah. All right, you say, thanks for having me, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for having me. We'll record next time get, get. on the CBS. <laughs> on the CBS. <laughs> <laughs> say, uh, Bye, Griffin. Say classy Hogwarts. On the double. <laughs> On the double. All right, thank you. Well, <laughs> I am right. gonna, I'm gonna keep that stay classy right. Hogwarts like at the end of the episode. That's awesome. <laughs> I, I'm totally gonna keep that stay classy Hogwarts thing at the end of the episode. <laughs> That's gonna be fucking fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and the tree and the car crashed <laughs> <laughs> oh, i love it okay let's let's uh let me see <clears throat> hello everyone and this is hogwarts radio broadcasting to harry potter fans worldwide since 2008 i'm terrence pinkston i'm bailey riddle 